Welcome everyone. We are at um, the Medical Bureau at Eastwood Traffic Way today and we have a wonderful group of people and we will be teaching the first class of Dr. Ann's Way Less for Life. So welcome everyone. I'm glad you're here. I'm Kathy Berry. I'm the registered dietitian with the Fountain of Health Wellness Program and I'm very happy to be here with you today. So let's get started. Um, in the past, we had um, gone through Dr. Ann's Eat Right for Life class. This is just a really good book on the truth about really good nutrition. And I love this book. We shared it throughout the city. It's got some great, the, the really good backbone of what a good eating plan looks like. And then the second book that we're going to start featuring today is the Dr. Ann's Way Less for Life. And what she has done is she's taken the principles from Eat Right for Life and then she's added a weight management, weight loss component to it. So everyone is always trying to manage their weight. And Kansas City is not li unlike any other city in the United States. We have, you know, 60% of our population overweight or obese. And so it is really a, it is really a crisis and, and it's something that we really need to focus on. And, you know, the good news about weight management, it is completely possible. It is completely possible to manage your weight. It is completely possible to eat healthy, eat right, enjoy food, have great food. And that's what this class is all about. So I'm very happy that you're here. And let's get started. Um, first of all, this book is not a diet. I, there are a lot of great diets out there, but I personally don't do very well when I know that I have to eat this for breakfast, this for lunch, and this for dinner. It doesn't go well for me. But I do like the concept of let's just have some really good habits. Let's just have really good practices on a daily basis, and that will lead to weight management, and that will lead to weight loss. So that's what this whole book is about. It's a manifesto. It's like a story of this is how we eat right and this is how we manage our weight. And what we'll do is we've got 21 tips and tricks and it's about the how and the why. How it works, why it works, and then we're going to give you an action plan of how you weave that into your daily life because that's really the trick. The, the, it's not on a diet, off a diet. It's this is the way that we eat. This is the way that my family eats. And this is the way that we manage our weight. So that's what this is all about. So what we know is um, your body weight is of monumental importance. Other than smoking, it is the number two determinant of your overall health. So what's the first thing you do when you go to the doctor's office? You get on the scale. Does anybody like the scale? I don't like the scale. Mr. Scale and I, we're not friends. But he tells me the truth. And it is really important that we have a guideline. And the scale is just a number. It doesn't define your total health, but it is a good, it's a good snapshot. It's a good place to start. So we have to know what our weight is. And it is really important to weigh yourself on a regular basis. Um, so your body weight has a massive impact on your overall health. And to, what we know is too much body fat and where the body fat is located is really the key of good health. So what we know is over the years, and this is no surprise to you, these are the things that affect, that weight affects. We know that obesity and weight gain has to do with high blood pressure. It's just a big tax to the heart. We know that it increases your serum lipid levels, your cholesterol, your triglycerides. We know that it is a big precursor to type 2 diabetes. A lot of times when people have type 2 diabetes and they clean up their diet and they lose 10, 15, 20 pounds, they don't have to take medication anymore. So weight has a big, big um, component to type 2 diabetes. Coronary heart disease, stroke, gallbladder, osteoarthritis. But then we figured out some more things that weight has to do with. And it has to do with sleep apnea. Most people who struggle with sleep apnea are overweight. Most people, there are some cancers that are strongly linked with obesity and weight gain poor fitness, fatigue, low vitamin D levels, and depression. And the thing that's really interesting about depression, it's not that people who are ob obese or overweight are just bummed, sad, depressed because they're overweight. Their body isn't quite as capable of making those good hormones that keep yourself you know, in a happier state like the serotonin and the dopamine. So it's really interesting. Um, so the more that we study obesity, the more that we learn. And this whole story right here tells me 
we were not designed to be obese. Now there are all different kinds of shapes and sizes of people. Some are leaner, some are heavier, some are more muscular, but the human body clearly was not designed to flourish in an obese house. So that's what that story tells me. And so having, you know, knowing all that, over the years we've really looked at weight in different ways. Back in the old days when I was a dietitian in the hospital about a hundred years ago, we used to look at these um, metropolitan life charts. Do you remember those? Those were really funny because the way that they came about that, they were actuarial tables and they had to do with people who died. So that's how they determined those charts, which I always thought that was kind of amusing. And then we got better and we came up with a BMI. It's a body mass index and it's a mathematical equation, height over weight squared times 2.12, yada, yada. But anyway, it came up with this, this BMI and what we give now to people is a range. And what we know is if it's less than 18 and a half, it's kind of too lean, um, perhaps at risk for some disease, perhaps for, at risk for some bone density problems, perhaps risk for uh, a poor immune system. And then we know that 18 and a half to about 25 is optimum. So for example, if I were five foot two, I should weigh someplace between 104 and 136. So that's a nice big range, okay? That's a healthy range right in there. And then we know that 25 to 30 is overweight and over 30 is obese. However, that's, you know, that's better than the old metropolitan life charts, but that's still not perfect because what happens is there are always people who have a big frame or who have a big muscle mass or are just um, very fit but not overweight at all, and they show up as overweight or obese on this chart. So it's still not perfect. So then we did some more research, and then we found out that where the fat is located really tells the story. So, how big is my belly? It's on page 17. What we know now is that where the fat is located has a lot to do with disease. So, the abdominal region right here, that is very, very important. We call that fat metabolic fat. It has a lot of effect to do with the liver's ability to function, the heart's ability to function, digestion. So what we found is that um, for women, optimal is between 32 and 35, men 37 and 40. So, you know, those are, those are kind of the ranges. And we also know that abdominal fat carries more risk than hip and thigh fat. So lucky for all those with a big fanny, that's, that's not going to hurt you. <laughs> So, anyway, um, this is what we know about how big my belly is. Has to do with overall disease. So what, now what we know is, now we look at weight gain. And think about, okay, who has gained 20 pounds since they were 18? Many of us. But what we find is when people steadily gain weight over the years, that increases their uh, all different kinds of diseases. Women who gain more than 20 pounds between 18 and midlife double their breast cancer risk. Gaining 11 to 18 pounds during adulthood increases type 2 diabetes. And then we also know from two big Harvard studies that men and women who gain weight <coughs> increase their risk for heart disease. Well that's no surprise. We all know that. But what is very interesting is that we also know the other story. Every one of us in this room knows someone in our family or someone in our circle who never seems to change. They're 70 years old and they don't seem like they've changed at all. And they still mow their own yard and they have a garden or they ride a bike or they walk the dogs or they do something and they kind of seem ageless. They may get a few more wrinkles, but they're still doing everything that they've ever done. Do you know people like that? I know people like that. Yeah. Okay. So that is the story of what good health looks like. And that, and, and it's very interesting because it's kind of like this big circle to me. They stay active, their life doesn't change, they don't gain weight, and then they stay active, and then they don't change, and then they don't gain weight. It's this big circle. So when the activity changes, then the weight gain happens, 
and then all of this happens. And interestingly, I told that story because less than 10% of the population maintain their weight, but we all know somebody. And are they healthy? That's the story. That's the story right there, is that 70-year-old auntie or uncle who's out mowing his yard and feeding the birds and having a garden and doing all the things that they do, but that's what keeps them healthy. So that's the story. So metabolic numbers. Um, did everybody here do your HRA and your biometric screening this spring? Okay, we always come around, we take your blood pressure, we weigh you, we find out what your blood sugar is, and it's not for me to know, it's for you to know. And the reason that, it, that we want you to know this is if you look on page 20 in this, of your book, these, those numbers right there, they tell a big story. And what we know is that um, an increasing blood sugar over 100, an increasing triglyceride level, an abdominal girth that increases, all of those things increase your risk for type two, type 2 diabetes. Once you increase your risk for type 2 diabetes, you also increase your risk for the metabolic syndrome, which is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. You get it all together wrapped up in a nice big package with a bow on it. So. But that's why you want to know those numbers, and that's why we do those, that big HRA, every year so that you can keep track of that. So it, it tells a very, very important story. And what we know is when this belly fat, this, this abdominal region, increases, then we know that, that right along with that comes insulin resistance, and then along with that comes metabolic dysfunction. And all insulin resistance is, is that the pancreas is wearing out. When you have um, more and more calories and more and more uh, increased sugar in the diet, then the, the pancreas has to make more and more insulin, and then the insulin doesn't work as well because the pancreas is just tired and the cells don't see it as well, and that's why that mild weight loss just turns that whole situation right around. So that's, that's why we do that every year, and that's why it's important to you and to me for all of us to know what that is. And sometimes the best, the best guide to what your weight is and your activity is, is how your pants fit. So, yeah, absolutely. All right, so know your metabolic numbers. Back in the old days, 100 years ago, when I was a dietitian in the hospital, we never even batted an eye when a person had a blood sugar of 125. That was, that was normal. But now we've learned that when it starts steadily climbing up a fasting blood sugar, that that is an indicator that we're not using the insulin as well as we should. So we've gotten better at diagnosing that. So when your blood sugar is over 100, your fasting blood sugar, it doesn't mean that you have type 2 diabetes. It means that you may want to clean up your diet a little bit because you're not using your blood sugar very well. You're not managing your insulin very well. And in a little while, if that would continue, you may run into some trouble. So we've just gotten better at, at being able to look in the crystal ball and seeing what lies ahead. But I remember clearly back in the old days, we used to see people We'd have blood sugars of 212, and we'd be like, maybe not so much lemon pie. I mean, we just didn't get so upset about it, but we've learned a lot. So um, the bottom line is you have control over your health, and even small amounts of weight loss can really affect your overall health, like your, your blood pressure. People tell me all the time, I lost 10 pounds, my blood pressure got better your blood cholesterol, your, your um, blood sugar. And of course, your joints are gonna feel better with a 10 to 15 pound weight loss. It's just easier for your, your joints to carry around less. So now that we've learned about that big, wonderful story about how important it is to manage your weight, um, now we're gonna talk about the 21 strategies to lasting weight loss. And again, this is not a diet. These are just 21 tips and tricks to really help you. Um, I would not suggest trying to do all 21 at the same time or you'll be, you'll be taking my name in vain. So I w as we move through these, I would just like focus on maybe three or four that you know will help you. Like that's something that I can do. I could do that a little bit better. And then really work on those. And then as you, you know, work through that, you're going to find some uh, weight loss and a little bit better diet as a whole. 
Okay, the first one is the great white hazards. This is what we call, um, and I really like this part of the book. I really, really like this part of the book. The great white hazards is this huge amount of refined carbohydrate that we eat in the United States. Back in the old days when our grandparents had a farm and they cooked everything from scratch, they probably did eat some white carbohydrate. They probably had white bread. They probably had white flour, but they ate much less of it than we do today. Just stop and think about how many McDonald hamburgers are served in this country every day. And what are they all served on? A white roll. When we go and we have a, 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 a Chipotle bowl that we all love so much, what is it, what is it served with on the side? rice and a great big white tortilla that has like 300 calories. So we have become just accustomed, accustomed, used to all this white processed flour in this country and it really isn't very good for us because what it does is white flour, white rice, white potatoes and sugars and sweets, what happens is they have a huge glycemic index and all the glycemic index number means is how fast it can raise your blood sugar. That's all it means, like you can look up a glycemic index and it'll say, you know, cherries, 44, white bread, 100. All it is is a number that, that shows how fast it can raise your blood sugar. And interestingly enough, the things that raise your blood sugar the fastest are these things. You would think maybe it might be a banana or a pineapple because they're sweeter. It's not. It's this white refined stuff. And the thing that is really important to know about how fast your blood sugar raises is our body doesn't like that. We don't like it when our blood sugar raises really, really quickly because then there is a whole bunch of things that have to happen. The body has to make insulin. The insulin has to take the sugar into the cell. It's kind of like a lock and a key. The liver has to get involved and has to figure out what am I going to do with this? Am I going to burn it or am I going to store it as fat? So when we have this huge increase in blood sugar, it really puts the body under some stress because it has to figure out what it's going to do right now. When we don't have this increase in blood sugar, when we get a slow rise in the blood sugar, then it gives the body, the liver, the pancreas, it gives it a chance to react and it, doesn't, it can have the opportunity to burn the fuel. When it raises really fast, sometimes we have to store the fuel. And what is stored fuel? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the story. That's why when you hear that story of see white, think fat, there's some truth in that. Now, it's not to say that you can never have this, but there are better things that you can eat that really manage your blood sugar a lot better. So that would be the first big thing I would tell you to do is really try, and here's your plan of action. It's on page 30. Really try to get the white stuff out of your diet. Things like instead of a white potato, have a small sweet potato. Or now they have these beautiful little dark purple heirloom potatoes. They're in your CSA. Did anybody get those in your CSA? They're really pretty. Does anybody here do the CSA? Don't you love it? I love it. Anyway, so intact grains are also really good for us. The intact grains are the ones that, um, like if you held it in your hand, you could see the whole grain. You could see the brand on the outside, the brand on the outside. You could see the endosperm. You could see the germ in the middle. Things like whole oats, you can see that. You can see that when you look at um, quinoa or barley in your hand. So that is an intact brain, grain. And when, <laughs> an intact brain. <laughs> Hopefully I have an intact brain. Um, so choose whole intact brains, sweet potatoes, and then definitely avoid sugar fortified beverages. What we know about the low glycemic meals, the things that have less of that is it keeps us full longer. So you can imagine if your blood sugar doesn't go like this and like this, and your blood sugar goes up slowly and comes down slowly, you're gonna stay full longer because blood sugar is the trigger for hunger. So if we manage the blood sugar, you can manage the hunger. Anybody have any questions, comments? Okay. All righty. We also know there's a, we've got a nice little section in here about dark chocolate. A little bit of dark chocolate actually has some very um, appetite suppressing qualities. And it also is a very good um, satiety for a sweet tooth. 
but you have to be able to control the amount that you eat. So a little bit of dark chocolate is good. So what we know about the great white hazards, all the white stuff, is they are strongly linked to diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, lots of, lots of diseases. So yes? So when your blood sugar goes up, you yeah. get hungry. Mm -hmm. Also, when your blood sugar goes down, mm -hmm. do you get hungry? Is that true? or is it Typically, when your blood sugar goes up, you get really um, jiggy. Like you've got a lot of sugar and a lot of fuel. Like when you eat a, a Snickers bar and a cup of coffee, you, you know, you feel really good and you have a lot of energy. But then what happens afterwards? Right. That's right. And that's when you get hungry. And sometimes you also get kind of woozy, kind of, kind of lightheaded and maybe grumpy. Um, <laughs> but th typically that's how it works. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. All right. So, um, the summary of doing your carbs right is the best effective strategy is just to avoid the white stuff, eat more fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And then um, what we know that protects against hunger and protects against weight gain is the combination of the um, non-high glycemic carbs with some protein like yogurt, nuts, lean protein, veggie, well the veggies aren't really protein, they're more carbohydrate. But those th that combination right there, a little bit of lean protein, a little bit of high fiber foods, that really fills you up and it will give you a long period of being full. All right, so number two, so that's the first one. Get the white stuff out of your diet. The second tip or trick is fiber. Now, when we think of fiber, when you think of fiber, what do you think of? Metamucil. Metamucil. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound very tasty. What else do we think of when we think of fiber? Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables, okay. Do we think of fiber like it's going to be tasty? No. no. We think of fiber like that's what old people need. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But actually, it, the interesting thing about fiber, it is your secret weapon for weight and appetite control. And the reason is, is because things that are high in fiber, like beans, they take a while for us to digest because all that fiber, we just can't burn right through it like we can that white carbs. Those white carbs also don't have a lot of fiber. So this fiber kind of slows that whole process of being able to break that carbohydrate down. So just think about this for a minute. Think about how full you feel when you have a big bowl of chili. Pretty full. And think about how long it lasts, okay? Now think about how full you feel and how long it lasts when you have two glazed donuts. It's completely different, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so th there's, there's a couple things that come into play there. One is the fiber. The glazed donuts don't have any fiber. The chili has a ton of fiber. Half a cup of beans has six grams of fiber, so that's a lot of fiber in there. The other thing that it has in there is protein. And the protein also slows that down. But this fiber business, this is kind of like your secret weapon. Think about this for a minute. Think about how fast can you eat a cheeseburger from McDonald's when you're in your car? I can eat it in four bites. <laughs> okay? Can you eat it in four bites? Probably four or five bites. Uh, four, four if I'm really hungry, five if I'm trying to be ladylike. Okay? So that's fast. You can eat that fast. Okay, now that's 350 calories. Now let's think about a 350 calorie salad. That's going to be about this big. Lots of spinach, carrots, tomatoes, some healthy dressing that's got olive oil, maybe some beans, maybe a little bit of low-fat cheese. That's a big salad. Okay, think about how long that takes you to eat. You can't eat that in four or five bites. So the other thing that fiber does is it fills your stomach up while not providing a lot of calories and it volumizes. It's a lot. Whereas that little cheeseburger, you can eat that in four or five bites and your brain and your belly really don't have an opportunity to talk to one another a whole lot and say, oh, you've had 350 calories and 12 grams of protein. Yeah, it's gone. So that's, that's why fiber is your friend, is it volumizes your, your food. And as it turns out, we are, you know, we, we as human beings liked the feeling of having food in our, in our belly. I personally do not enjoy the, the sensation of hunger. To me, it kind of hurts. 
okay? I don't know very many people that do like hunger. And there are those people who forget to eat meals and whatnot, but I, they are a mystery to me because I've, I never forget that I haven't eaten. So that's why fiber is your friend, is it really fills you up and it sticks with you for a while. So your plan of action is 25 grams of fiber a day. Does anybody know how much the average American eats of fiber a day? Less than 10. 10. 10 grams of fiber. That's not very much. So it's, it's a trick to get 25 grams of fiber, but I will tell you, one of the best things that you can do is try to have beans in your diet. And um, black beans actually have a lot of vitamins and they are the most digestible. And so when you throw some black beans in a salad, when you throw black beans in a stir fry, it's just a really good way to get some more fiber, some more protein, and really, really good for you. So all of these things right here, increase your intakes of berries and apples. All of those things will really increase your um, fiber content. And then cereals like the Kashi brands of cereals or the um, old fashioned oatmeal, those also are really good sources of fiber. And then your whole grains, your intact whole grains like quinoa and bulgur, all those things are really good in terms of fiber. Any questions? Anybody ever had quinoa? You like it? What do you do with it? Just buy a quinoa brown rice mix uh -huh. and cook it. Yeah, and yeah. It. Good. A lot of times substituted for rice because mm -hmm. if you're going to have rice and something, you yeah. get quinoa Good. instead. Good. Anybody make a salad with it? That's good. I think the best quinoa salad always has tomatoes, um, some fresh parsley or cilantro, whichever that you like and then a really good vinaigrette and onions and a little bit of feta cheese. That is a very nice little summer salad. And then any kind of veg cucumbers, whatever veggies you want. More veggies, the better. But those, that combination of the vinaigrette, the feta, tomatoes, cucumber, onions, it's good stuff. Okay, so that's how we're going to get some more fiber in our diet. Um, one of the most predictable and defining features of people who lose weight and keep it off is that they eat a lot of fiber. And I'll tell you what they eat is they eat a big salad. Lots of people who manage their weight, one meal a day is a big salad. Really good habit to get into. So either eat it before your dinner or just have it as a meal for lunch. It's a very, very good habit to get into. Um, and then these are your best choices down here. So there we go. All right, third. This one goes right along with the fiber, but it has to do with the volume. So what, we want, what you want to do with your meals is to pump up the volume. So things that have a lot of volume but not a lot of calories. Um, let's, let's just think about this for a minute. You know when we think about our snacks, our traditional snacks in this country, and you look at a vending machine, what is in the vending machine? chips okay all right so let's think about let's a, a snack in the afternoon would be one of those little bags of Doritos it has 170 calories and it's like this big okay that's a, about that's about what a bag of Doritos is can you imagine th this you know one of those big bags of little baby carrots that are about this big that has 170 calories now what do you think is going to make your belly feel like it has more food in it that's right. So that's the whole story about volume. We like to feel volume in our stomach. So fill up on high volume, low calorie foods, lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, they really, you know, reduce that feeling of deprivation. The other thing that it does is we enjoy eating typically and it takes a while to eat fruits and vegetables. So you actually feel like I've eaten something. When you gobble something down like a Twinkie, you know, in three bites, it's gone, it's over, but when you eat, you know, two big apples for a snack in the afternoon, you actually, you actually feel like you've eaten something. On page 43, there's a list of superstar foods for appetite control, and I really like it because these are things that, um, you know, we should just have in our diet, like, and in your pantry all the time. This should be like your go-to staples. So every meal, every day, you should have lean animal protein or lean protein that doesn't necessarily if you're vegetarian you don't necessarily have to eat meat but lean protein is always good with every meal plant proteins non-starchy vegetables mushrooms have a really good um, zinc level they're pretty good in vitamin 
uh, B, the B vitamins, and they also are very rich and meaty, so they give a lot of um, depth to food. Non-tropical fruits, the reason that she kind of focuses on the non-tropical fruits like apples and berries and melons, those are non-tropical fruits as opposed to the tropical fruits like mangoes and pineapple and bananas is just that they have a little bit lower um, glycemic index. Certainly not to say that you can never have pineapples, but she just likes the non-tropical fruits, especially the berries. The berries are the superstars of all the fruits. So, um, but all of these things are really filling and they'll uh, volumize your uh, meals and keep you full for a long time. All right. Um, I want to show you this plate. So one of the, the plan of action here is fill up half your plate with veggies. This is what our plate looks like, okay? This is what our plate should look like. We got half of your plate is fruits and vegetables. We have some protein. We have a little bit of starch. Okay, now let's think about what our plate looks like in Kansas City when we go have barbecue. I love barbecue. I'm not going to lie. I didn't know much about barbecue until I came here, and now I get the joke. It's really, really, really good. But when we go to a really good barbecue restaurant, does our plate look like this? Okay, all right. Now, when we just go to regular old Applebee's, does our plate look like this? No. Honestly, yeah, it can, but, but it's hard. I mean, it's, you have really have to make a concerted choice. Honestly, the place that you're going to have your plate look like this is at home in your kitchen in your house. So um, this is how you volumize your, your meals. Lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, some lean protein, and some starch, some good starch. So volumize your meals, double up your fruits and vegetables, focus on non-starchy vegetables, and this is what your plate should look like. If you're not a vegetable lover, I would roast them in the oven with some olive oil and a little bit of garlic and then reduce a little bit of balsamic in that little skillet that you cook an egg in. And then when you take those uh, vegetables out, drizzle that balsamic on top. It caramelizes a little bit. Don't cook it too much or it'll get thick and burn. But you just want it to be like the consist consistency of real maple syrup. And it's absolutely fantastic. Kids who don't like vegetables will like those vegetables. So you have to, you know, if you're not a vegetable lover, if your family's not a vegetable lover, if you just boil the broccoli in the pan and put it in a bowl, it's not very tasty. You have to play with it and you have to add lemon and herbs and make it good. So, all right. So number four, give your plate your full attention. Now this doesn't really have to do with nutrition. This has to do with behavior. Let's just stop and take a peek at this picture. There's a young lady, she's sitting in front of a computer, she's eating a burger, and it looks like she's drinking a Coke and she's clearly overweight. Now how many times do we do that? A lot. How many times do we eat in front of the TV? How many times do we eat in front of our computer? How many times do we go to a movie and we get the big bucket of popcorn and we eat the, we don't even know, and do you know how much popcorn you ate? No. So that's the whole thing. We, there's a whole, a whole um, dimension of weight management that's called mindful eating. And what it, what it basically is, is pay attention to your food while you're eating it. Sometimes we get in the habit of eating in front of the computer, eating in front of the TV, and we lose track of what we ate, how much we ate, and what our serving is. And honestly, we don't really enjoy it because we're not paying attention. We're just eating, okay? So the more attentive and mindful we can be, the less we eat now and later because we actually realize that we've eaten. So give your food your undivided attention. You actually enjoy it more. So reserve eating for just eating. Sit down at your meals. I'm not, a, I, I'm not very proud to tell you this, but I will be honest, there's many times that I've come home from work starving, starving, didn't pack a snack, and I walk in the house, I still have my coat on, and I'm eating cottage cheese out of the container in front of the refrigerator. Anybody do that? Yeah, yeah. Starving, starving, that's what starving people do. So you have to plan ahead and you have to be smart and you have to be respectful of food. So before you eat, take a few seconds, calm yourself. Just take a few moments to think about what you're grateful for. Um, recall what you ate at your previous meal. 
If you had a Z-Man sandwich from Kansas City Joe's, maybe you might want to have a sandwich for, or a salad for dinner. Um, enjoy your food. And here's another one. We don't, if we eat really fast, our brain and our stomach need to talk to each other. And it usually takes about 20 minutes for them to realize, I'm full, I'm happy, I'm satisfied. So once you fix your plate, and first of all, fix your plate at the counter and then go sit down at the table. When the food is in front of you at the table, it's very easy to go back for seconds. But once you've finished your plate, give yourself a break and say to yourself, if I'm still hungry in 20 minutes, I can have more. And chances are you will not need more. So don't go back for seconds for at least 20 minutes. Really good habit to get into. So, um, and then avoid distracting stimuli like a computer and just pay attention when you eat. So the motto is when you walk, walk, and when you eat, eat. So enjoy your food, sit at a table, even if you're by yourself. Set your place, sit down, enjoy it. Um, and we are going to call it um, a day for this class. We've gone through the beginning of the class and we've talked through the first four, the white carbs, the volumize, the fiber, and then the paying attention to what you eat. Those are the first four topics. We've got 21 in all, so we'll wind up the class with the first four and the next class will probably go from number five to number 12. So thank you all for joining me today. Um, I hope this was informative and enjoyable. Does anybody have any questions? Comments? All right. Thank you so much.